interchange as another one says that well we would like to work with you central government because we think that you are interested in what uh, uh, in what we are doing. For me, the uh, 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 central bank question that one would like uh, uh, to pose, which you, you you mentioned the issue of uh, uh, of financial inclusion, is what does the emergence of this industry mean for policy objectives? And what policy objectives would it be useful in? And which policy objectives could the emergence of this uh, uh, industry actually? Post and threat or post prosperity. Now, financial inclusion, financial access, I think from what uh, I hear is that this thing uh, would be very useful for financial uh, access because it brings down the cost of the provision of, uh, uh, of financial services. So for now, let's forget whether you are a financial institution, a tech company, or anything. Let's focus on what the policy objective is here. The policy objective is financial access and financial uh, and financial inclusion. Is it cost effective? If it, it is cost effective and it brings down the cost of providing uh, these services, then it is something that is to be uh, that is to be uh, uh, to be welcomed. Of course, then it raises uh, 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 the issue, the issues that uh, come that the uh, service is provided here. And of course, I'm a central bank. I've got to be skeptical. And then I would ask uh, the part of the TNA. <laughs> <laughs> what is the what is the likelihood that this could uh, Pose in, in, in financial stability challenge. And the reason I started with financial inclusion is because I think we said as a regulator that the question was asked what financial stability risks that it had uh, posed. And I said, but wrong question. Because you see, if you put any group of financial stability practitioners and you say, find financial stability risk in anything, who will find it? <laughs> so, 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 so that is why the point of departure for me was. There are a range of policy objectives. Whether you are talking of financial integrity, you are talking of financial uh, access, or you are talking of financial uh, stability, or you are talking of consumer protection, it doesn't matter. So we would look, we, I would then look at these emerging technologies and say, what do they mean for each one of those uh, regulatory objectives and how useful uh, that would be? The experience that we have seen uh, in the South African context had been that uh, it had been very positive for uh, for financial uh, for financial inclusion and for financial access, and it brings down uh, the cost. Uh, this chap that they are uh, pretty modest, but the truth of the matter is that they are eating the lunch of the vents and, uh, and the vents <laughs> sit down and what vents are not going to work. You either try and eat your supper or your breakfast. <laughs> and, and so this so crumbles on the side. <laughs> No, and, and then of course it raises it raises issues of the regulatory space because you see if you are operating in a financial services space, you are licensed, and our duty as regulators is to protect the perimeter of uh, that license. So if somebody comes into that licensing space, the question that we then have to ask is: this one coming in into this uh, uh, licensed space, what does it mean for the for the competition. The competition objective is important. If they are bringing a competition and bring down the cost, great. But does it mean that their competition is unfair because they are regulated lightly compared to uh, the other players uh, in the industry? So for me, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that becomes uh, that becomes uh, that becomes crucial. Now in our experience, so 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 we are talking about uh, about this stuff and uh, in a, a developing country where you have got a lot of instruments. Think, think, think of a plumber who, who goes to some house, there is a leak at some house, they go and fix the, uh, the, and then they must be paid. Nobody can make an invoice and then say that I will come and pay or pay into this account and all of that, or pay cash and so forth. And what has since then happened with the technology was that there started to be mobile points of sale, mm -hmm. which literally now you, you no longer have to pay that gadget. It works on your Right from your smartphone, right? And then you look at that, is that it has eliminated the risk for the uh, for the plumber. Um, and the plumber no longer has to worry about this. And then, of course, the procurer of the service does not have to worry about, let me go and get the money, or uh, I will have to write a check. For all intents and purposes, there's no one writing a check anymore uh, in South Africa. Everything is done, uh, is done digitally. But it's almost run on the back of the 
of the day in uh, of the day is and last year and then I I I, I, I will keep quiet. Is that um, we have to deal with the issue of resources. South Africa has to pay uh, about uh, 18 million um, social grant uh, recipients, and it used to be that with uh, poor people we have to send them in queues, in scorching sun or in the rain or some waiting to be waiting to be uh, paid. We looked for a solution. A solution, a solution came, and it is like a card, but it's using biometrics. Uh, and we've been working with uh, uh, this stuff, and eventually we set a national biometric standard, which we then uh, set, shared with EMD, and it's likely to become an international uh, biometric standard because of the manner in which uh, it works. People are raising all sorts of uh, risks. But the point of the matter is that the idea that you're going to an ATM and you need a pin. Use your thumb. And if you can use the thumb, why can't you use your eyes to recognize who you are? That is for me the convergence, uh, the convergence of uh, the convergence of technology. So anyway, we think of uh, this thing not more than just emerging technology, but technology driven by financial services innovation. Because it doesn't matter how you you, you couch it. If you appear to it and you say no, but I just provide the platform. The truth of the matter is that. You have provided a mechanism for the financial service to take place. That it is not you who is doing things. So should we think of you as a form of an information exchange? And if you are as some form of an information exchange, should we be saying that when we want to regulate you like a financial uh, institution, we might have to regulate you the manner that we regulate exchanges? We're sending our raises in South Africa next week. <laughs> Again, we're all witness to that. <laughs> Klaus, uh, do you think all that is just uh, a phenomenon that is going to accelerate so fast that it will transform instantly? Or are we in the infancy where you have adventurous, courageous disruptors uh, that are going to gradually change the picture but over the course of time? What's your sense? You've done some research on that. Well, I, I would start by saying that, of course, this is also a very courageous question to have to try to assess beforehand how uh, relevant this is all going to be in terms of transforming the financial industry. But coming from Europe, it will surprise you that I always uh, begin with taking a little bit of a historical uh, perspective. I think a lot of financial innovations uh, uh, have their cradle in Europe. Think about double entry bookkeeping in Genoa of the 14th century, paper banknotes in Stockholm of the 17th century. In Amsterdam, in our own golden age, we had the Amsterdam Exchanges Bank, which had accepted various metal coins from different countries, different currencies, in order to facilitate trade at that uh, time. And one of the innovations it had there was that for the first time it had a systematic ledger, a systematic ledger that kept track of the transactions in a trusted, immutable, and also centralized uh, place. And that was a nice combination. It brought a lot of profits to the city of Amsterdam, who owned the uh, exchanges bank. Um, but also, it lowered the social cost of transaction. And that was clearly uh, an e extremely important uh, externality here. Uh, but we also have a history of uh, innovations that, of course, did not make it in that field. I mean, in the Netherlands, we had some offline electronic wallets that were apparently that were too cumbersome to load up each time when the wallet was empty again. At that time, you didn't have all the online facilities, and this is 20 years ago or so that I'm talking about. And we've also seen some innovations that not only failed to produce tangible benefits, but that actually were outright harmful uh, to society. Yeah, think about the uh, AAA-rated asset tax security <laughs> created uh, before the crisis, which were also sold as a great financial innovation, and in the meantime, we know that yeah, what the consequences... Uh, what that the consequences was not were. very transparent. Then. That was not very transparent, and I agree. And that is a difference with many of these, these fintech innovations that, that hold the potential of, uh, of transforming market functioning. It's, uh, it's, it's clearly a hip development, and, it, and I also think that much of it is useful. But it's also very difficult to say beforehand which of these innovations will actually succeed which will fail and bring risks. Distributed ledger technologies, crowdfunding, robo-advice, machine learning, digital currencies, all of them could actually succeed, but some of them will also fail, and it depends very much on specific design features, on institutional context, etc. So what is our role in, that, uh, in, 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 in this development? Well, 
first of all, it's good to keep in mind that it's clearly not our role to pick the winner. I mean, we are in a market economy where experimentation and, uh, uh, and taking commercial risks is something that is up for market participants. They need to sort the grain from the cap. That's not our role. What is our role? Our role is, of course, to consider not only the benefits, not only the private benefits and the social benefits, but also look at potential costs, social costs, private costs, and clearly there is an issue for regulators where social costs deviate from private costs. Where, for instance, the social costs of failure uh, exceed uh, the private costs, uh, and that is when public policy uh, interventions are, are, are justified. Now, does FinTech have the potential also for these uh, features to take place? Yes, of course they do. Connectivity, for instance, is something yeah, that is also strongly related to the technology. Connectivity means that there is a potential for external externalities, and then there is the question, of course, to what extent are these externalities sufficiently internalized, or uh, do we need official regulation uh, to make sure that it is uh, internalized? Stop here. Or? No, no, 